I found it a really interesting morning, actually. And if I was one of the entrepreneurs, I'd be feeling, I forgive you for feeling a little beat up at the moment. You know, Elan opened up this morning and basically said everything that you know is wrong, uh, which is absolutely right, actually. Uh, Matt's has come in and said your idea is probably going to fail. Uh, and then we had a panel saying that even if it succeeds, you know, the chance of anybody you know, paying for your drug and what they're going to pay is who knows. Uh, but you still sat here, so, so you know, that at least shows a sense of uh, ambition, which is, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about you know, fundraising. Uh, and why you still sat here is because there's a lot of money for life sciences and healthcare, for biotech and medical device funding uh, out there. And this schematic is just a very high level description of some of the sources of funding that exists. In reality, given the state where a lot of you are, you've been focusing largely where that sort of pink blob is. And we'll explore some of those sources of funding in a bit more detail as we, uh, as we go through uh, the talk. But there'll be some uh, factors that sort of drive the type of funding you get, uh, even at this stage right now. Uh, and there's a lot of those, but a couple of the key ones, really. Uh, and Matt alluded to one of them, which is, uh, do you have something that can be privately financed as opposed to publicly financed? And the key driver of that is, is there intellectual property you can create around it? If there's not any sort of private intellectual property that you can create around it, you will not obtain private funding for it because the value will be captured by the public rather than the private investor. And I know having worked with, um, you know, companies in previous years, sort of very early stages, that is one of the key considerations. And I know that certainly it's something that panelists look at. So there's, I guess, a broad assumption here that you sort of identify that there is something, you build a company around a piece of property that you can, you can build it around. And prior to that phase, really, you are looking at what we call non-dilutive sources of funding, so grants, uh, you know, university grants, research grants, and things like that. Essentially. Uh, free money, it's obviously not free money, it's taxpayers' money, it's my money, uh, and Matt's money, and, and everybody else if that has a job. But essentially, you know, you're not give, having to give away equity. Uh, and there is an argument that says actually, you know, survive on free money for as long as you, as long as you can. Um, it's a bit of a simplistic message, and, and actually, as we talk through, uh, you know, sources of funding, one thing to be aware of is, I'm going to make a lot of generalizations, which are just necessary in a talk of this, of this type. Um, it's unavoidable, and there will always be exceptions to what I'm talking about. But just bear in mind that there are some generalizations there. Uh, so free money until you've got a, a sort of defensible or a clear IP uh, position. The structure of funds we're going to come and talk about later as well. And sometimes this issue of asymmetric information which is, you know, you think you have the best technology, some of what Elan was talking about earlier. Uh, but if it's, you know, just a really, really hot area, you know more about it than anybody else. And even the most sophisticated outside investors just may not have, you know, the time or the inclination or just, you know, the belief that actually this is something at all. You know, years ago when I first, actually before, when I was still at school uh, in a different area, um, you know, this is belief that you could create energy from the process of cold fusion, which got everybody excited, and a lot of money went into it. And uh, I mean, it was literally driven by one person. It all proved to be an absolute sham, and a lot of people lost their, you know, lost money over it. Biotech has its own stories like that as well. So there is that sort of, uh, it's not an argument to say, don't be super, super innovative, of course, with your ideas, but just sort of bear in mind that sometimes being you know, the pioneer at the wrong point in time, it's difficult sometimes to get acceptance for your, uh, for your ideas. Uh, and one of the key things, of course, about when you slip from non-dilutive funding into dilutive funding is how much you want to be diluted. So as you, once you start down that process of taking private money as founders with owner shares, you are going to start to become diluted. You know, which shouldn't really be an issue if you're paying attention to what Matt said, which is if your business idea is great, you'd much rather own a smaller percentage of something that's worth billions rather than you know, maintaining control and 
you know, wanting to influence direction and having a large stake of something that has probably a higher chance of failure because of that, because of those reasons. Okay, uh, do we need to talk about this? Yeah, so just in terms of early stage funding, I mean, if you aren't going to go down the road of looking at equity, there are lots and lots of sources of non-dilutive funding, and there's a few listed here. It's a very European focus uh, for obvious reasons. I know we've got some non-European groups in the audience as well, but there are lots. There are lots of foundations, uh, patient groups, for example, that will fund early stage research, um, and these people clearly uh, tend not to be motivated by the private return, so they won't be doing the sort of calculations that you know, Matt showed, for example. This is really... You know, a charity, for example, being the obvious case, you know, they just want to, they want to be seen and they want to, to pioneer truly uh, innovative, you know, medicines. Governments often establish, you know, seed funds, uh, some of them on the sort of rather bizarre notion that you have to then relocate to a particular part of the country or, or the world in order to access them. We have our own uh, here in the UK, for example. Um, so just a, a, a variety of the sources of... Uh, Largely non-dilutive funding, just there. Um, Matt talked about angels very briefly, and I guess this is the first group that provides private financing. If you think about the path that you might take from non-dilutive grants, charitable funding, you'll come across angels at, at some point or another. Um, and this is where one of my gross generalizations begin. So what are angels? They're typically <coughs> private individuals, um, some of them motivated, some of them are ex-entrepreneurs. We know a lot of ex-entrepreneurs in biotech that still want to play a part, they'll put their money to work. Uh, quite often they're disinterested, you know, doing it for tax breaks. There are a number of tax schemes, for example, in the UK that encourage people to put money into private investments and they get a tax write-off if they hold that investment for a certain number of years. Uh, and these angels can be a, you know, a useful source of funding. A lot of companies get financed through angels. Anywhere from sort of you know, 200K up to 2, 3 million. Um, but there are a number of things to be aware of. Um, one of the key things uh, is really how much capital can they provide and for how long can they do it. And that is a function of their <coughs> motivation, so why are they you know, funding you, and obviously their capacity uh, as well. So again, just to give a very generalized example, you know, someone who is doing it for tax reasons alone and thinks, well, you know, by putting two million into this company and getting a tax break if I hold it for three years, you've got to ask yourself, is that person going to be there when you've spent that two million, you've done some proof of concept work and you want to come back to them, are they going to be so inclined, you know, to give you some follow-on money? Uh, you know, and some angel groups are and, and some aren't. Some deploy in, in larger amounts, some deploy in smaller amounts. You know, some, you know, an angel syndicate, for example, could deploy two million, but it could be a lot of small checks in that. A lot of individuals writing literally a thousand pounds at a time. That's a pretty inefficient way of fundraising and it can lead to a lot of volatility in, in, in follow-on situations. Equally, there are some angel groups that are, you know, it's a much smaller collection of individuals. You have much more certainty as to, you know, can they be there in, in future rounds uh, as well. Uh, it's essentially private wealth. So as you'd expect, the way to access a lot of that private wealth is essentially through the city, through private banks, family offices. There are some formal angel schemes. Uh, uh, I've listed a couple there for the UK Angels for Sci Life Sciences. London Business Angels Network, you know, there are pitching events. They run essentially like an investment process. You can apply, much like here. You go through a process in front of the investors, and if they like it, they'll, they'll sort of invest. And, and there are variations on the theme. So some of them, there'll be a lead-type investor who perhaps, with their investment, brings some degree of validation on the science. And then the others will tend to sort of follow, uh, follow that as well. Um, now, having said that angel investors are good for typically kind of 200k to 2, 3 million, you know, there are exceptions. And anybody who follows this industry, uh, especially from the fundraising side, last year uh, there was a company called uh, Immunical, an Oxford company, 
that raised um, the second largest private round in biotech history, the largest for a European company, half a billion dollars. And that company is almost 50% owned by private individuals. And not a lot of private individuals, just a handful. Who have been putting money into the company for years and continue to do so you know, in quite large chunks. Um, so there are, you know, in, in reality, I wouldn't focus on the outliers. You know, and that's a, an exceptional story that goes back a long, long, a long, long way. Uh, but in reality, you know, angels are going to be providing, uh, you know, money in smaller amounts over a shorter period of time with less certainty as to will they be there for the next round. And, and that's an issue, right? Again, because Matt said it makes sure you can raise enough to get to an inflection point, so you can raise your next round at a better valuation. You know, if you're literally being funded, you know, six months to six months or year to year, it's going to be very difficult. You know, you're not going to get the sort of inflection point. You'll get to kind of milestones, but the milestones will be not that meaningful in terms of you know, in terms of value. Yeah. Any questions on angels? One thing, actually, just a note on angel funding, I'll put the comment at the bottom. Beware the long tail. Sorry, Dan, did you? Actually, no. Yeah. Uh, beware the long tail. What I mean here is, is that um, when you're raising money, you know, your share register, your cap table, if you've raised it through a lot of individuals, uh, you know, they'll all be holders of shares to you know, a certain degree. Let's say you get to an inflection point and you want to raise money from a venture capitalist. Um, there will be a natural tension across several points. One of them will be, you know, sort of valuation. Uh, but venture capitalists typically invest through one type of structure. Private individuals, especially if they're doing tax reasons, are forced to invest in ordinary shares, you know, for example. So there's a couple of points of, you know, tension here. And the longer your tail of private investors who invested in that particular way, the harder it can be sometimes to get a deal done with a venture capitalist. Not impossible. I've got many clients who have you know, a long tail of private investors that they've kept very sweet and managed to keep the VCs you know, sweet as well. But it, it is an issue, you know, and I, it's quite a common thing to hear about, you know, management teams that have difficulty managing the long tail, you know, of private investors. And that can include, for example, given that many of you will be coming out of university, um, university seed funds that like to, typically in Europe certainly, like to exert you know, quite a large ownership stake, or quite a large ownership stake, but without the ability to really follow on their money, you know, which just causes an issue with you know, VCs and later stage investors as well. Uh, and again, that's something just to be uh, you know, wary of. What you can really do about it, I don't know, because you need the technology, you've got to get it out. Um, but that's you know, a big issue, actually. Um, and I know Dan's done a lot of work around that with respect to the UK and US. Yeah, Dan, sorry. Yeah, and uh, when you mentioned actually, so a 200K round or a 500K round from angels, you know, it, sometimes it's one angel, but oftentimes it's what, maybe five or 10 angels that are coming through to close that round? Yeah, that's right. And, and again, how it's actually executed can, you know, vary. Anything from you literally take money from each individual to a scheme whereby and again, getting into sort of legal and structural terms, I don't want to dwell on too much, but there is one investment vehicle that's registered on, you know, on, the, on the cap table, and the individual sort of come through that. It's a nominee type structure uh, that they come through that. But yes, I mean, um, it could be, it could be a handful, like the Unicor example, to you know, sort of tens. Typically, if done efficiently, you won't have to deal with tens of investors. You'll have to deal with the person who represents that angel syndicate. So, for example, if you go and see Angels for Life Sciences, you know, there are about 40, 50 angels that sit behind that. But you don't have to go and see them all, you know, one by one. You kind of go and see, um, you know, the people representing the syndicate, and then the proposition is passed out, you know, to them, and, and uh, you know, the money comes in, comes in that way. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to. Flip, we're going to start talking about VCs in a minute, and I just want to sort of paint a picture of. Uh, the totality of VC funding for, you know, life sciences. Uh, and, you know, we've been, the last three, four years especially in venture capital funding, 
uh, in biotech have been uh, you know, quite a mess. Now we've got some European data uh, and some US data, data as well, and some data on where the money's been uh, spent by sort of indication area across biopharma and, and devices as well. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going into that. You'll get these slides, you can look into it yourself. I think the key takeaway, there are a couple of key takeaways. One is really about being informed. You know, there's a lot of investors out there. They each have their preferences of where they like to invest and the kinds of things they like to invest in. So just really educate yourselves about the funding market a little bit and figure about, you know, I mean, for example, you know, if you're a device company doing, um, you know, dermatology, and you see that in 2015 there were only six deals done, a total of 107 million, that's going to be quite a tight funding environment versus, you know, if you're doing something like oncology with two and a half billion dollars of venture capital money invested. Now, that's just pure quantum. It doesn't speak to, you know, the uh, competitive aspects. You know, so you've just got to think uh, through these things. But there is a lot of money out there. In 2015, again, in terms of new fundraising being raised, uh, it was another record year for, for VCs again. Um, so there's, there is quite a lot of money out there, not as much as in tech venture capital, uh, as you'd expect. You can see it on the US private data, where you've got in 2015, around about 60 billion total VC money, of which 12% you know, of that was, was biopharma, and 4% of it was just devices. Um, I know there's a couple of uh, entrants here with sort of digital health uh, business plans. And this is an area that's seen huge uh, growth and in investment, you know, as well. Uh, last year, another record year again, you know, touching on for $6 billion in, in digital health. Um, you know, it's, it's just been quite a phenomenal area of growth. And this includes you know, sort of B2B as well as B2C, you know, type things as well. Um, and again, we can talk a lot about that uh, uh, over lunch. Uh, so, VC investments. Um, it's worth spending a little bit of time on, you know, venture capital funds, uh, just in terms of how they're structured. And I guess what I want to do uh, is, whenever you're going to see an investor, it's always worth knowing how the world looks from their side. I think, you know, try and understand what they're thinking and what their issues are. I think the place to begin is to understand what is a venture capital fund. You know, Matt is a venture capitalist, Elan is a, is a venture capitalist. Uh, there are tons of people out there. But, yeah, but really what dictates how they work and how they invest? Uh, and actually, Elan and Matt are two very different types of venture capitalists, not really represented by this. Uh, and we'll come on to, to, to their peculiarities in a minute. Uh, but a typical venture capital fund, you know, where does it get its money from? Um, from institutional investors, from pension funds, from governments, insurance companies, uh, from banks to a degree, and from very, very high net worth individuals. Uh, and they give money um, to venture capitalists who then lock that money away for typically 10 years, and so you can have your money back in 10 years time. I'm gonna go away and invest it. I'm gonna charge you money each year for the privilege of investing it. And uh, in 10 years, 12 years time, you'll get more money back uh, than you gave me. Uh, so it's unquoted, it's private. Um, and typically in the context of a 10 year fund, they'll be making investments over the first three, four years, holding investments for say, you know, sort of six years. Uh, and then starting to exit through a variety of means. And a number of things follow from that structure, I guess, uh, because you're not obviously the only investment that they make. So your future, to an extent, is tied up with the fate of the other companies in that portfolio. And again, a simple generalization will uh, you know, suffice is that they could have invested you as the first investment in that fund. You know, full of hope, really exciting. Let's say they're doing 10 deals in that fund. Now, imagine a universe where the other nine deals they do actually end up performing better than you. You're not doing badly, but the others are doing better and they need more money. But you need more money too. Now, they have a limited amount of money, you know, to give and they're thinking about an overall 
return, and I'll come to some high-level maths in a minute. But all of a sudden, it's not just about you and your technology and how good it is. It's about the fact that they've got these other nine mouths that need feeding as well. So they're always trying to assess, which is, you know, I've got these limited reserves left, having given each every company its initial round of money. I've got limited reserves left. How do I, how do I optimize my next round of investment decisions based on the fact that I've told my investors they're gonna, I'm gonna turn 100 million into 300 million or four or 500 million. So there is that sort of interesting, uh, you know, interesting dynamic um, as well. In terms of, I, I guess, sticking with that sort of portfolio <coughs> theme, you know, what sort of investments do they, you know, look for? I think I'll just give some illustrative numbers uh, you know, based on some recent research that we did. Um, a VC fund may say to its LPs, its institutional investors, that I will, over the course of a 10-year fund, deliver to you 20% IRR, return, you know, per year. Uh, return, obviously. Uh, let's just call it a 100 million fund, which is small for a VC, but the numbers uh, help to that degree. If you're holding each company for six years, six years average holding period, uh, you can play back with the maths a little bit, but essentially you get to a place where you need to make six times return. The VC needs to make six times return on that money. If you look at some research on business failures, you'll find that there's obviously quite a high failure rate. And let's say the failure rate for new businesses is one in two. So you end up in a situation where they've actually only got 50 million, because 50 million has been written off. <coughs> You've got to take 50 million into 300 million. So surely each deal should make six times return, is the way they should look at it, right? But in reality, because the future is unpredictable, and because you know, what Elan said is absolutely right, even with the best estimates and the best data, you're going to be wrong. And if you actually look at what transpires in reality, if you cut open a VC fund and look at how they made their money, again, a bit of a generalization, but typically in a portfolio of 10 deals, you know, one will be delivering you know, 30, 40x, one will be delivering about you know, 10x, 15x, and one in the rest will be doing sort of two to three, two to three x as well. Obviously, it varies with the cycle, and you know, so it's a bit of a generalization. And that, on average, will get you a sort of six times return. So it means that when a VC is looking at your investment, they're not thinking, oh, is this a six times return? They're thinking much higher. They're thinking way beyond 10. They are really thinking, is this going to hit it out of the park? You know, and they're the deals that they want to do, knowing that, actually, 80% you know, of them are going to end up being you know, two to three times return. But actually setting a bar that's much, much higher than that. So again, if you go back to Matt's talk about valuation and exit and what you need to achieve in terms of value, you know, it very much plays into that. And it very much plays into the valuation you attach to your company now. Because what do you want? Do you want to go in and raise money at a, you know, 100 million pre-money, knowing that the VC is thinking, oh my God, I've got to get 20x on this. Is this really you know, a company that's worth that much? Or would you much rather go in at a you know, a five million pre-money, knowing that, you know, a hundred million to get the 20x return, 150 to get the 30x return is more, is more achievable. So that's kind of how they're, you know, thinking about it to a large degree. It's always really about the sort of, you know, the exit value and can they deliver the return to their investors as well. Because the whole raison d'etre is to go and raise another fund. You know, that, that's what they do. They raise money, they invest it, they make exits, they give the money back, and then you go and raise another fund. So in order to keep raising new funds, they've got to show exits, and they've got to show cash back, cash return back. And you know, cash on cash return tends to be more important. I mean, IRR is a lot of the ways that uh, these funds are analyzed, but as we have a saying in investment, you can't eat IRR. You know, cash is really what counts at the end of the day. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind. The other thing to bear in mind is that it's very unlikely that it's going to be one VC that takes you to a certain inflection point, to a certain exit point. A lot of these guys, even in the US, will invest together in syndicates. 
So as well as making sure, so that, uh, there's a, an onus there on making sure you get the syndicate right. And you know, the VCs will kind of form the syndicate themselves to a large degree, uh, but not always. And you know, you do end up in situations, I've got something, you've got one, more than one client, it happens all the time where you have a syndicate where people have come in at different times, different size funds, they face different pressures within those funds, and a fundraising comes round, and some investors can commit and some can't commit. And that can cause you know, eruptions over valuation, over whether deals you know, get done. So again, it's very much sort of in line with Matt's point that you know, make sure that you have visibility over future funding. Don't just think about the here and now and just to the next milestone. It's actually you know, about the milestone after that as well. You know, can, they, can they take you to a certain, uh, a certain distance? And just some names and you know, typical VCs there. Um, they're obviously a hugely important part of you know, the funding environment in, in life sciences. Um, you know, there was a, a while, not that long ago actually, when VCs found it quite hard to raise money because they'd lost a lot of money uh, in Europe and the US. Uh, but they've kind of turned it around a bit. There's been new funds raised recently. Um, and you know, they're a variable part of the ecosystem. I know a lot of experienced people who've had their fingers burnt through VCs and don't speak highly of them. Uh, you know, vulture capitalists rather than you know, venture capitalists. Uh, you can know, ask me if there's any truth to that. I would say is that you know, VCs are people off at the end of the day as well. They're all very different, they have very different motivations. And we'll come to some learning points at the end, but really, no matter what brand that VC wears, it's instrumental to really understand really what's driving their motivation, how they invest, what their investment strategy is, you know, what deals do they like doing, how do they invest, who do they invest with. Uh, and a lot of these strategies will be quite different. You know, there are some funds that we work with um, that you know, are, are fantastic funds and have a great track record, but the situations in which they like to invest and the way they like to invest um, you know, upsets a lot of people, but it works for them. It allows that fund to go out and continue raising more and more money and putting money to work in the sector. Other funds are a little bit different. Um, hmm. This, I'm not going to talk about this example in a lot of detail, but when I was putting it together, I guess the point I wanted to make is the well, it's that disconnect in the syndicate, you know, potentially that can that can arise, and I guess the point of being too greedy about valuation at different points in time. So ignore all the detail at the top. Just look at the bottom. This is a hypothetical company, obviously, that's been through three rounds of financing, uh, an A and B, and uh, a C round. Um, post the C round, it was worth 35 million. Let's say this company exits at 100 million of valuation and just follow the money and see who's made what. Series A shares are holding 11%, so they're going to get 11 million. Uh, the Series A put in 2 million. So cash on cash, they're doing just over five times, which is you know, OK. Uh, series B and Series C, you know, they've got roughly similar percentages, about 20 odd million each. But they put in 10 million. One of them put it up in a, an up round, one in a down round. So they've only really made just over kind of you know, two times in this scenario. And I'm making a big assumption here that A, B, and C are independent you know, sort of groups of people. It just simplifies the story to a large degree. So I guess the question to ask is, is if, you know, roll back that history and follow this company through its fundraising journey, you know, was it too greedy when it raised its B round? Did it really leave enough potential value on the table for the people who came in at the B and C round? Because they ultimately only made sort of two times their money. Would that deal even have been, you know, done by those B and C investors who are, after all, setting a bar of, you know, 10x plus, you know, on their money? Uh, and again, I've seen this played out in reality, you know, kind of too often, uh, where companies get initial round of funding, they get some sort of validation, and they push for, you know, a pretty chunky valuation, and they wonder why these deals don't get done. And in reality, a deal like that probably wouldn't, wouldn't get done at those sorts of numbers. 
Uh, and again, it all comes back to that point of, you know, uh, be satisfied with a smaller percentage of something that's going to be much, much, much bigger. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, the lawyers can talk to this actually in a lot more detail, but, you know, some standard terms you can expect to see in, in VC are just listed here. Valuations at the bottom, it's clearly going to be one of the most important things. Um, you see more commonly in Europe, you know, sort of tranching of the money, so quite a big headline number. You know, a deal will be done for 30, 40, you know, 50 million. But in reality, it'll sort of be dropped in at various points in time, and the management team will have to perform to pass through the gate and get the next, you know, round of money, the next tranche of money. Um, and again, how flexible, you know, the syndicates are over releasing money, being flexible over tranching, varies with VCs. Uh, some are, you know, quite flexible. If you miss the milestone for very legitimate reasons, because there's been a, a change of focus, uh, or you've decided to do something entirely different, it can work. Others might, you know, hold you over a barrel and say, well, actually, you know, we're going to have to open up a valuation question here again. Um, so tranching is more common here. Uh, Pay-to-play anti-dilution and liquidation preference. Um, a lot of this is to do with sort of syndicate dynamics, investor syndicate dynamics. You know, anti-dilution, I hope, is reasonably self-evident, but, you know, um, investors like to maintain a certain percentage you know, ownership. They, they can put schemes in place to make sure that ownership percentage is, is uh, preserved as the funding rounds continue. Uh, and pay-to-play is a way of making sure that, you know, investors in earlier rounds do pony up and contribute to later rounds, otherwise they get, uh, you know, crammed down uh, of, uh, in, the, in the investment. Again, I know that the lawyers are talking later, maybe they'll cover some of these, uh, some of these aspects as well. So I, what I was talking about was very much uh, a classic sort of venture capital, if you like, what we call a GPLP fund. The LPs being the, the underlying investors that, that provide the money, the GP being the general partner who manages uh, the fund on a day-to-day on -a -day basis. Uh, there are other VCs, and Matt and Elan are uh, good representatives of, of those um, corporate VCs. Um, so a lot of firms, big pharma, uh, tech firms, for example, will have in-house venture capital arms, which do essentially the same thing, but with some key differences, really, that are driven by their different structure. So recall, again, that a, a typical VC is getting money from third-party investors, putting it into a you know, specific sort of structure and promising it back in, you know, in 10 years. Again, it's a little bit different for, you know, different types of corporate VCs, but corporate VCs are different in that there'll be one underlying investor, which is the parent. So in the case of SR1, um, it'll be GSK. It's GSK's money, you know, at the end of the day that they're providing for that. Um, it may well go into a, you know, sort of vehicle, but it's a sort of a greenfield or open-ended vehicle, which means it's not limited by time to the same degree. Matt... Uh, as far as I know, typically it doesn't sort of promise uh, that, you know, definitely within 10 years GSK will get its money back. It's on a more rolling basis, uh, which can change dynamics, obviously. Uh, and that's a good thing in many ways because it means that you have the ability to have long-term support. Uh, if you're drawing money fundamentally off a corporate balance sheet, and that's a strong corporate parent, you know, you've got, you know, you're not limited to the same extent by the finite fund size of a, a more uh, regular venture capital uh, as well. Uh, the other aspect, I guess, that, you know, corporate VCs differ to a degree in that some are going to be very strategic focused and some will be very financial focused. Uh, I think SR1 is a good example of a fund that is very sort of financially focused. It operates in that sense like a VC fund. And you can see that with the investments that it does. You can see the co-investments it will work quite comfortably alongside uh, more regular VCs as well. Um, so what that means is, is don't automatically think that just because if you get money from Matt is that he won't be bound by the same constraints as a regular VC. Depending on who's invested with, he may well be. He may well hold you to that sort of standard uh, as well. Uh, and obviously there's a... I guess a network benefit potentially from working with a corporate VC. And even if they are 
not strategic and doing it just for sort of financial aims. There is a network that they can access internally that can you know, provide sort of added value. And VCs always like to talk about the added value they provide, that they're not just writing a check that they can help you with strategy and get deals done. And you know, to an extent, that is absolutely true. They're very well connected, these firms. You know, the best have been doing nothing but healthcare investing, biotech investing, uh, you know, for decades in, in some cases. So they have a track record, they have networks, they can do this. Uh, but corporate VCs can do the same uh, as well. Um, some, that strategic financial distinction, I think, for me, is one of the sort of keys, really. And trying, if you are going to sort of work with a corporate VC, really trying to figure out which camp they're in, essentially. Uh, and I would say I would personally feel more comfortable working with a VC that's financially motivated, which might seem counterintuitive to where you're sat now and think, well, surely somebody that's interested in the science and you know it's a good fit with the parent, uh, you know, makes more sense, and there can be longer-term potential for collaboration there. And in theory, that's true. But getting in practice, the way I've seen it, uh, the story come about too often, uh, is that strategic objectives change within very large firms especially. You know, they're beholden to shareholders, in some cases on a quarterly basis, which means plans change. People move around. So the sponsor for your project for that deal may have moved on. Um, we've seen biotech is, uh, you know, life sciences is open to its own fads and fashions as well, whether it's, you know, immuno-oncology or microbiomes or digital health. And soon as, you know, the industry moves on to the next thing. If you're not that next thing, there can be a lesser appetite to sort of continue funding. And this is an area where uh, a more regular VC perhaps has the advantage because you know, having made that investment and they've got finite amount of money, they've got a finite life, they've got to make those investments work. They don't have the luxury necessarily of just walking away unless there's been something sort of tragic or disastrous happened with that you know, with that company. So that those motivations can differ. And really, you've got to try and sort of figure this out and ask questions. Um, so that's sort of corporate VCs as well. As I say, there are, they've come really to the fore in the last sort of three to four years. Yeah, people like SR1 have been active for a long, long time anyway, JJDC as well. Um, but we've seen, as a whole, them come to not dominate the market, but certainly play an increasing and more important role in Europe and in the US. Uh, and that's both for financial reasons and for strategic reasons. Um, some of it's about feeding their pipeline you know, for the future. There's hardly a week goes by with somebody, big pharma shuttering an R&D department or getting out of you know, oncology or something like that. But really, when they say they're getting out of oncology, they still want access to good oncology technology that they can shift with their distribution arms. So they're becoming you know, sort of distribution companies. So they're always on, on the hunt and looking out for things uh, like that as well. And there are just some illustrative examples, again, split by device and, and biopharma of um, corporate VC uh, funds as well and what they've done over the last last couple of years, which is quite uh, significant. Interesting, we've got GSK is distinct from SR1 there, um, and GSK do do separate deals on occasion, um, which I don't know if you knew about or didn't know about, but they are recorded separately, which causes you no end of headache. Okay. Um, honorable mentions. So this will be less relevant given the stage where you are now, but it just, I guess, colors in the rest of that schematic at the beginning, which is, you know, what happens when you get to, let's say you are successful and you are looking at, for a, a round of funding to take you through to a phase three, which is typically not the domain of, you know, a venture capital firm. What are the options then? Uh, and typically it's an IPO, so you're raising public money, uh, you know, on NASDAQ. The last three to four years have been, you know, boom time record amounts of money raised publicly from specialized investors and generalist investors as well who've come along for the ride because they've seen what's been happening with the, uh, with the index as well. Uh, you get to a certain point, and it needn't be when you're 
making revenue even, but you've reached a certain inflection point when taking on debt becomes realistic as well, both conventional and senior debt as well. It's not going to be relevant to, you know, to where you are now as well. Um, and uh, something that the market's been hearing a lot about over the last few years has been so-called crossover funding. So investors that cross over from one asset class into another. Uh, and the, the dividing line they're typically crossing is whether a company is private or public. And uh, you know, that's, you know, there are some investors that are just not allowed to invest in private companies uh, and some prefer only to invest in public companies. Crossover investors really span both. And they really uh, were the kind of rocket fuel behind the boom in the NASDAQ uh, biotech index by essentially anchoring IPOs pre the IPO and then committing to the IPO as well and allying themselves with leading life science VCs, which then means you've got a solid, you know, you've got 30, 40, 50% of the IPO round already committed through specialists, uh, which then gets the generalists, uh, you know, the more general pension funds and mutual funds uh, that aren't really specialized in particular sectors, they just put their money wherever you know, they, can, they feel they can get a return. Uh, so that's been quite a, a feature of the market uh, as well. Uh, I'm not going to talk about value too much, really. I mean, Matt obviously talked, you know, that was his talk. Uh, I guess let's just go, you know, I'm aware that we're kind of slipping into lunchtime, but um, key points to note, I think, you know, fundraising is really, really, really hard work. You know, and as a biotech entrepreneur, you spend a lot of time doing it. Um, I work, Matt works, Elan works with, you know, management teams of companies that have been around for quite a while. And, uh, you know, it's hard to raise the money. And when you raise the money, it's typically for, you know, 18 months, two years. And then well before that time, you've got to be thinking about the, the next round of money and what's happening then. So it is a bit like painting the fourth road bridge. You, know, you can always be thinking about money and then syndicate dynamics and, uh, you know, uh, what to do. Um, investment is fungible, so you know money is obviously interchangeable. Money is money is money at the end of the day, uh, but the investors, the people, aren't. So it's worth spending a lot of time on not just thinking about you know how much can you get, but really who is giving it to you and what are their expectations, and that could be anything for simply from you know control aspects, but value add. And can you work with these people? Because you will be with them for quite a long time. And because of the influence they have and the access to networks, um, you know, they will influence not just the direction of this particular venture, but you know, potentially future ventures as well. So you've got to get the chemistry right, essentially. It may be about something as cold and commoditized as money. But really, you know, these people like to get involved in the detail uh, and so there has to be a good chemistry there as well. Um, you know, do some homework. A lot of the information I've presented is publicly available. Uh, a lot of you know, what I've told you about the structure of funds, there's a lot more depth there. Um, you know, myself, Elan, Matt, and others involved with the program will be able to educate you on that. Just don't go in naive and thinking, well, you know, um, it's a venture capital fund, I need a million pounds, these are the people to go and see. You know, a, if it's a half decent life science venture capital fund, you know, they're not going to give you a million pounds for the reasons I outlined earlier. You know, they've got to put a certain amount of money to work at a certain point in time to drive a certain return. If you go and see a firm like NEA, which was last year raised 2.3 billion for its latest fund, about 40% of which is devoted to healthcare, the rest is tech, right? They're not going to give you one or two million pounds. There's no point in even asking them you know, for it, no matter how good your technology. They just haven't got the bandwidth or the inclination to do, to do something like that. There are better sources. So figure out you know, what you need. Where is it going to get you? Where are the best sources for getting that amount of funding? And it may be that actually, as Matt rightly pointed out, rather than asking for what, again, might make intuitive sense of small amounts of money and not being greedy, actually you ask and say, well, this isn't a million pound ask, it's an eight million pound ask, which gets me to this particular point, and this is what I'm going to do, and this is the value that you'll see created out of it, and think about it in, in those terms as well. Um, 
accountability. This is really, I mean, this is less about sort of investment. This is more about a sort of management uh, point, really. But it drives um, investment decisions as well. And I'll illustrate with actually a very current example. Uh, and I obviously can't mention uh, the name, but it's a client of ours that was angel funded. Uh, and it did very well, a very continuous source of angel funding, and went out to raise a round from uh, US VCs uh, in this case. And it got a lot of interest, you know, um, and you know, a round that was going to be 20 million turned into a round of 30 million, which became a round of 60 million. Uh, term sheets flew around, you know, pre money valuations were agreed, and everything was going really well. It was taking you know, quite some time because new investors kept getting added to the syndicate, which kept driving up you know, the, the, size, you know, the size of the round. And at a certain point in time, and I don't want to sound cynical about this, but at a certain point in time, you know, by which point the angels felt quite exhausted and not able to contribute any more money, um, an interesting thing started to happen, is that all the investors, the potential investors, who collectively were going to provide the 60 million started uh, a process, what we call price chipping, which is essentially finding all sorts of reasons to drive down the pre-money value of the deal. And a lot of these reasons had nothing to do with the sign at all. Because all this while, and this process was eight months in process, everything had been progressing absolutely fine. But there was bits of paperwork they asked for that was taking the time for the company to provide minutes of working group meetings with you know, the big pharma partnerships they had that they were being asked to sort of provide. And all of these reasons collectively just delayed things, which put the money closer to its cash out date, which put pressure on the valuation. And where it stands as of today, eight months down the line, the pre-money as it stands at the moment is 40% of what it was eight months ago. And this is with everything going right scientifically. You know, and now the company's in a situation where it's thinking, you know, I'm being screwed here, quite frankly. On the one hand, these are great names, but clearly they want a good deal, you know. The point being is that, uh, well, there's quite a few points, actually. Maybe the company was being greedy with its pre-money eight months ago. Did it really do its homework and think, is this the right pre-money that ensures the VC investors get the exit that they desire, and was the disconnect there, really? And the management team should have been better informed and more aware of, you know, kind of what might happen. And you know, who's to say the valuation today is even the right valuation? You know, it's subjective. You can do all the modelling you like, you can do all the comparables you like, but ultimately the VCs are going to be thinking, you know, you want this much from me, I've got to turn it into this amount. You know, what are the chances of making that happen? You know, how do I make that happen? Have we seen any deals like that that have happened? You know, what, what sort of implied money return is that? Um, so it's really just a point on process. Again, less relevant now, but just think about it as you extract the technology from universities and you know, carve up your management agreements and, and so on. Um, and don't obsess over value, obviously, I hope is, is the one lesson. And also grill your potential investors as well. You know, yes, you want money from them, but it is genuinely a relationship, and you should look at it like that as well. Uh, you know, a long-term relationship, and, and find out if this is the sort of thing they do. If you don't know, you know, what experience do they have in investing in these sorts of areas? Um, I put up a slide about digital health. I'm seeing a lot of life science investors uh, move towards digital health. Now, a lot of them have never done anything in digital health at all. You know, digital health business models, for example, are just very different. The way a digital health business, essentially a software business, scales is very different to a therapeutics business. You know, so a lot of them are getting into these things, looking at the hockey stick graphs and seeing what their tech VCs are doing and thinking, oh, this looks something good to get into. But a lot of them without the experience, so you know, grill them about what they're, what they're good at, what they've got track record in. Um, and if they don't disclose it, maybe there's a reason behind that. Or you know, speak to people that those investors have worked with. I leave it there. I'm a bit conscious I've gone over, but if there are any questions, happy to take them now or over lunch. Can I'll you be around for a little bit. Yeah, I've got a I've got a meeting. I've got to get back to the office quickly, but I can hang around for a little bit definitely. Yeah, this card. Yeah. Everybody will be introduced. And uh, thank you so much. Round of applause for the man.